Welcome back to Genetics on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to do a second example of a dihybrid cross. If you need more practice with those, I did another video on that before this in the playlist, which you can go back and watch. All right, so I'm going to do a dihybrid cross for genes A and B. And A is going to be the gene that codes for height, and B is going to be a hypothetical gene that codes for speed. Okay? And the maternal genotype is heterozygote for both A and B genes. And actually, the paternal genotype is actually heterozygote for both of them as well. So we've got maternal, big A, little a, big B, little b. And our paternal genotype is big A, little a, big B, little b. So remember, for a dihybrid cross, which is what we're going to be doing for two genes, we're going to have a total of 16 cells because we have four columns and four rows, and four times four is 16. Compare that back to the Punnett square, which is where we only had four cells because it's going to be two columns and two rows. So remember, our first step in writing out our dihybrid cross is to figure out what goes in each of these columns and each of these rows. And for this example, again, I'm using the maternal on top, paternal down here. Uh, you can do it any way you want. Paternal can be on top. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. All right. Now, I take the maternal genotype, all right, and I've color coded them again. So remember, I'm going to take the big A and I'm going to pair it with both Bs. So I can get, let's do the blue big A, big B. So I put that here, big A, big B. And then for the green, big A, little b. Big A, little b. Okay. Now let's take the, uh, the recessive A allele, so this little a, and an orange pair it with this big B, little a, big B. And then I also have little a in red paired with little b, two recessive alleles for A and B. And I have little a, little b. Okay. So notice the father in this case has exactly the same genotypes for the A gene and B gene. He's a heterozygote for both of them. So notice if I do the same thing I did here for the maternal, uh, maternal crosses, you could think of them that way, I do that for the father, I'm gonna get exactly the same thing as I got for the maternals. I'm gonna get big A, big B, big A, little B, little A, big B, and little A, little B. And one of the most important things that you can do and when you, when you do a dihybrid cross is make sure you remember um, to set this up correctly because if you don't set this up correctly, the rest of it will probably be wrong, okay? Now that I have this set up, I'm going to fill in each of these 16 cells. And so you can imagine this is gonna take a little bit of time. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go each cell one by one, all right? So this first cell, and remember, I'm gonna pair the A's up with the A's and the B's up with the B's, all right? So I have big A, big A, and then big B, big B. All right, cell two, I'm going to have big A, big A, and big B, little b, right? And then for this third cell, I now have this big A from the father, but a little a from the mother. So I actually have a heterozygote A, big A, little a. And then for the Bs, big B goes with big B, 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 okay? Then for the fourth cell, again, I have big A, with little a, so big A, little a, and the same thing's gonna be true of the B, big B, little b. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but you can pause the video and see if you can get all of these um, genotypes correct, but this is what you would do for each individual cell if you had to do this manually by hand. And so initially what you would get is you would just get an A, A, B, B genotype in all 16 of these cells, all right? So, first of all, Let's go and figure out what the genotypic ratio is. All right, so we need to figure out the genotypic ratio. All right, so let me actually let me get a text box here. Insert a text box. So let's figure out what the genotypic ratio is. All right, so remember what we need to do is figure out unique genotypes. All right, let's just start over here with this one. So this is big A, big A, big B, big B. Do we have any other cases of that? Well, if you do a quick scan through this, I don't think that we do. Okay, we don't have any others like this. So there's just one of those. All right. Now let's go to this big A, big A, big B, little b. And remember, it has to be completely unique. So I can't do combine any with two big A's. It has to be big A, big A, and big B, little b. Well, do I have any more of those? Well, it looks like I've got one right here. Big A, big A, big B, little b. 
All right? So genotypically, there's two of them there. So I'm going to put a two. All right? Um, now let's go to the next one. Let's see big A, little a, and big B, big B. Do I have any more like that? Well, I see I have one right here, big A, little a, big B, big B. And I don't think I have any others that are like that. So there's two of those. Now in cell four, I've got big A, little a, big B, little b. Are there any others like this? And in fact, there are. In fact, this whole diagonal right here, big A, little a, big B, little b, they're all this way. So there's actually four of those. Okay, so four of those. Now what about, let's go to this cell. This would be cell six if we're keeping it the same. Big A, big A, little b, little b. Are there any other of those? And it actually doesn't look like there are to me. So I'm going to have a one there. What about, this is cell seven, big A, little a, big B, little b. Well, we already accounted for that. So let's go on to this one. Big A, this is cell eight, big A, little a, little b, little b. Any others like that? And it turns out down here in cell 14, this is one. So there's two of them. Okay, two of those. Let's go to this one. This is cell 9, 10, 11, cell 11. Little a, little a, big B, big B. There's only one of those, so one, all right? What about little a, little a, big B, little b? Well, there's one right here on this diagonal, so there's two of those. And then that leaves us with this one down in the corner, which is completely homozygous recessive for both genes, A and B, only one of those. All right, so you can see here we get a pretty complicated genotypic ratio. And I'll just go ahead and tell you two things. If you were ever asked to calculate this, which you probably won't, and I'll explain why in a minute. But if you were ever asked to calculate this, all these numbers should add up to 16, because there's 16 cells. So 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 2 is 5, plus 4 is 9, plus 1 is 10, plus 2 is 12, plus 1 is 13, plus 2 is 15, plus 1 is 16. So yes, it adds up to 16, so assuming I did it correctly, all the genotypes are accounted for. Now, like I said, you probably wouldn't be asked to do this because you can see for a dihybrid cross it gets very messy. You're much more likely to be asked about the genotypic ratio on a monohybrid cross, a regular Punnett square, not on a dihybrid cross. The phenotypic ratio is much more common on a dihybrid cross. So let's actually talk about the phenotypic ratio, all right? So we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's first assign the phenotypes, all right? Now remember, uh, gene A was for height, and the big A, capital A, uh, that's the dominant allele, and that means you're, that's the tall allele. Little a is the short allele. And then B is the gene for speed, so we're going to say big B is fast, that's the fast allele, and then the little b is going to be the slow allele. All right? So let's classify the phenotypes. So this first one in cell one, big A, little, or big A, big A, excuse me, is going to be tall easily. That's homozygous dominant. Big B, big B is going to be fast. And just keep in mind for this that we're going to treat heterozygotes the same way we treat homozygous dominants. They're going to have the same phenotype. All right? So big A, big A is going to be tall, big B, little b, fast, okay? Big A, little a, tall, big B, big B, fast, and so forth. Let's just keep going until we get one that's not uh, completely homozygous dominant or heterozygous. And scrolling across here, we get to cell six, and here's where we see our first one. We have big A, big A, little b, little b. So the big A, big A, this individual is going to be tall, but little b, little b, homozygous recessive, they're going to be slow. So that's actually our first non-unique uh, phenotype from what we've done so far. And basically what you would do is you would keep analyzing the phenotypes. And the way I do it is I deal with the first gene first and say that phenotype. And I just put a slash and then I put the, the phenotype for the second gene. Okay, You keep doing this. If we go to this cell, this one's interesting. So cell number 11, we have little a, little a. So this individual is going to be short. But then big B, big B, they're going to be fast. All right? And then we have another really interesting one. This is the last cell, cell number 16. We have little a, little a. So that's going to be a short individual. And little b, little b, a slow individual. Okay? 
And that's the only one actually with that particular phenotype. But what we can essentially do now is determine the phenotypic ratio. And this gives you a much more reasonable answer than the genotypic ratio. So let's start with tall and fast. So that's a unique phenotype. It has to be both tall and fast. And we're going to count all of them like that. Let's figure out how many we've got. So tall and fast. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So we've got nine individuals who are tall and fast. Again, just to point out where they are. So cells one, two, three, four, five, seven, and then nine and 10, and then this would be number 13, okay? So those are our tall and fast individuals. We also could have tall and slow. Let's count how many tall and slow we've got. Well, we've got this one in cell six, this one in cell eight, and then another one in cell 14. So tall and slow, there's three of them, all right? What about, oh, let's see, short and fast. That's, our, that's another unique one, short and fast. So we've got one in cell 11, 12, and 15. So there's three short and fast individuals, so I'll put a three there. And then we've only got one left, short and slow. Just one of those. And just like in the genotypic ratio, all of these numbers should add up to 16. So 9 plus 3 is 12, plus 3 is 15, plus 1 is 16. So that's one way you can kind of check to make sure your answer is at least reasonable. So um, it should add up to 16. But you can see here from the phenotypic ratio I just determined, it's a much more reasonable number. And for that reason, you typically will not be asked about the genotypic ratio for a dihybrid cross. It'll generally just be the phenotypic ratio for these kinds of problems. And there's also one other thing I wanted to mention that's actually really important. Okay, um, and this is just something you can memorize and it can make your life a lot easier. In some cases, you can be asked a question on a test that seems like you have to go through all this, but if you actually memorize this one thing, it'll make your life a lot easier. If you cross individuals, so if the, if the mother is heterozygote for everything, and the father is heterozygote for everything. So notice they're both heterozygote for both genes. If you do that cross, you can actually just memorize that the phenotypic ratio is nine to three to three to one. Because it doesn't matter what genes you have, A and B, C and D, X and W, whatever. If, you, if everything is heterozygous and you do a dihybrid cross, the phenotypic ratio is always nine to three to three to one. And so sometimes a professor can ask a question expecting you to know that, that if you're crossing two heterozygotes for two genes, phenotypic ratio is always nine to three to three to one. Now, if it's not all heterozygotes in both the mother and the father, um, then you actually have to do the dihybrid cross. There's not really a good number or ratio to memorize. But it is true, if you cross two heterozygotes for two genes like this, it's always going to be 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. But in any case, this is how you do a dihybrid cross, and hopefully you learned a lot in this second example. Um, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you for watching, and we'll do some more genetics uh, problems in the next video. Thank you.